this week's program, we're going to be having a look at real estate, basically how you should market your properties, what market is doing as far as price is concerned, and basically what's selling and what's not. We're also going to be looking at the Foundation for Arable Research and their chairman, whose name is David, is going to be coming in to talk to us about what they do, why it's important that you actually do keep them going, and even though that it is levy funded, why that investment is so incredibly important for you and your industry. But in just a moment or two, we're going to be talking about irrigation with Tony Daveron. Tony, the expiry resource consents, now that's a minefield. Uh, yes, it is, Rob. And we've had a couple of occasions in the last three or four weeks where we're, well, there's two lots of consents I'd, I'd like to talk to you about. The first one is, is people's taking use of water. Now, under, under Section 124 of the Resource Management Act, if you reapply for your resource consent within six months of it expiring, then you can carry on doing what, what you were doing uh, past the expiry date. Sounds, sounds a very unusual sort of a rule, but that's the way the law is written. And in that six months, the, the intention is that you'll sort out any issues with, in this case, it's Environment Canterbury, uh, and and I assume this is this, it will it will apply everywhere else when you when you when you're doing when you're reaching your expiry date. However, if you don't reapply by three months in Canterbury, the issue we now have is that uh, it won't be processed. Uh, in fact, we won't even get what we call a section 88, which is yes, it's been received. You've paid your deposit, and it all looks like you've got everything there that you need. And you get a tick off, and you can carry on with the process. In most of the most of the groundwater areas in in Canterbury now uh, that are considered to be fully allocated, then that activity then becomes a prohibited activity. So you can't even apply for your resource consent to be renewed. So you lose it effectively. Can we just look at that schedule again? You was you've got me totally confused. Okay, I'm sorry, so Tony. If your expiry date is the 30th of June, yes, then. If you apply before the 1st of January 2017, if, it's, if the expiry date is the 30th of June 2017, and you, you have make, already... And you've got your consent, yep. this is about renewing your consent to take and use groundwater. If you apply before the 1st of January, then you can carry on using that consent and you can use it past the expiry date because the Resource Management Act allows you to do that under a section one, what they call section 124. So that's just continued use until you sort out any issues you have with the regulatory authority over that renewal of the consent. However, if you forget about it... And if you haven't done that... If you haven't done that, then you get this little bit of a, a time lapse between the 1st of, between the 1st of uh, January and uh, whatever three months after that is, it was 1st of April, I guess it is, uh, that, that you, there's a little bit of a hiatus there that you can get it in and, and they will consider it. Or we're past both those dates. We're past both those dates. So we've had occasion in the last two or three weeks where we've had, where we've had clients say, oh dear, something a little bit different to that, but you can imagine, oh dear. <laughs> yes. Uh, I've just had this letter that says that, oh, my consent expires on the 30th of June and I'm outside the three month period. Um, Therefore, my consent won't be uh, considered. My reapplication. So they basically have lost their rights to irrigate. They've lost their right to irrigate then. So that you could have had this consent for 30 or 40, 50 years, and you potentially could lose it. And it's very unclear. Uh, it's actually a little unclear in the plan whether that was the intention. Uh, and and Environment Canterbury to to, to the give them their due, they, up until now they have, they've taken a, I guess a soft attitude on this, the guy genuinely forgot this consent has been around for ages, you know, I mean, you know, 1st of January to, to 1st of April or 1st of May is a really busy time for farmers, all sorts of things are happening, you know, I mean, take the dairy farmers for example, right now they're building up to Gypsy Day, mm. so they're about to put their cows on the road and go to the next farm. Uh, arable farmers are flat out um, harvesting and doing all sorts of things like that. So suddenly you reach this point, oops, forgot. So we've had to make a case that this farmer, these farmers have genuinely forgotten and uh, Environment Canterbury have been, have been 
pretty good about it up to this point, although they've said to us very emphatically that this is the last one they will make an exemption for. So we think if there's you know a few of these a few of these uh, uh, consent holders out there that have forgotten about this three month lapse time, this three month period, there will be many more. In which case they're going to fall into this three to zero months, and because they're in a fully allocated zone, it's a prohibited activity to take water because it's fully allocated, and they will lose their consent. Do you know how, what sort of numbers we're talking about? I can only go on the numbers that we've had come to us that um, that that are concerned that suddenly realise that oops they've made they've forgotten about it, and so that's two or three. Um, but we do know that in talking to the environment canary people that there are more than that without them actually telling us how many there are. Bottom line is that they're going to not be able to irrigate from here on out, so therefore That's, they're dry land farmers. They, are, they become a dry land farmer. Yes. Oof. So quite quite a you know it's you know I know what happens with resource consents. You get your resource consent. You either had it for thirty five years, and a lot of these consents that are coming up for renewal are, are those that have thirty five year expiry dates on them. But some of them will be ten, and they just get them and yes, got my consent. It goes in the filing cabinet. Uh, often the mail that might have come from Environment Canterbury um, goes in the, in the filing cabinet sometimes. Uh, and, and mostly in the busy time of the season, it's not, it's not read very carefully. And, and I, I think there needed to have been better, uh, better publicity about, the, about what the implications of these dates are. Mm, but these dates but are. It's, it's too yeah. late. It's too late. What's nature going to throw at us for winter? Well, uh, I was really hoping for a for a neutral type situation and we would continue to get large rainfall events. We've talked about that on a number of occasions already. All across the East Coast, we, we still need those sorts of events to get our groundwater levels up, get those rivers flowing and keeping them flowing. Uh, in the last uh, five to five to 10 days, there's been some reports coming out from the, from the global uh, climate modelers that there are signs uh, that, that an El Nino could develop during the winter. Uh, that's the last time for particularly in parts of Canterbury and parts of southern, uh, southern, southern eastern and North Island. That's probably the last weather system that we really want because that is, we know that El Nino is predominantly westerly, southwesterly weather. Uh, not necessarily w warmer than normal, but what it means, what it means for those areas is that those weather systems that bring the, the rainfall events, those southerly, southeasterly type systems, are not are not the predominant weather pattern uh, during the winter. So, uh, and and right now they're they're saying there's like a 50-50 chance of, of this happening. So the probability of it's about 50 percent of a dry winter of a of a El Nino winter, which is that south southwesterly westerly west, westerly weather. Doesn't mean it will be necessarily dry, but it 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 sort of points against us getting those very large rainfall events that come in from the east and the southeast. I mean, normally you would expect them to occur when we've got neutral type conditions or El Nino type conditions, which are predominantly easterly, northeasterly type weather conditions. So it, it it's probably just right now, it's just something, there's a flag up there. It's probably an orange flag at the moment, not a red flag, <coughs> excuse me, but it's it's something that when you keep, you know, we keep an eye on these things because we're looking for this for these big recharge events this winter, and uh, you know it's just not what not what I really wanted to hear and read. So um, I, I guess for I guess for those people that are that are dependent upon uh, particularly surface water from um, from from rivers that actually flow from more more from the foothill areas in both the North Island and the South Island. Uh, and groundwater, groundwater takers where we've got very low groundwater levels. Um, this is not the news that we really wanted to hear that we, we could be going away from systems that will give us really big rainfall events and give us recharge. And we haven't started next season. No, we haven't started next season and it is only the beginning of May. Uh, we need May, June, July, half of August at least to get those big rainfall events. Uh, if you look at the East and South Island rivers, for example, the Selwyn, the flow has receded back towards the hills. The Hines has receded back towards the hills. Uh, so 
what looked like a really promising start at the end of March into the first little part of April. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, we we really wanted a continuation of those conditions. You know, 50 or 60 millimetres every 10 days would be really nice if I could dial it up. Let's let's lay a myth because that's n the waters we're seeding back the flow levels has nothing to do with irrigation. No, it's not. At this stage of the year, it's got nothing to do with irrigation. The flow in that river is totally dependent on on there being rainfall events in the in the foothills, not way back on the Alps, not water that not rain. Not northwest wind not, rain. This is not northwest rain. These are the events that we saw on the east coast of both islands at the end of um, March and the beginning of April where we had three events in a row where we got these easterly systems pushing rain in against the foothills in both islands and those foothill rivers flow. Now when I talk about the flow in the in the in the Selwyn for example and the and the and the Hines rivers it means that that where it is actually flowing has gone back towards the hills so that water is now disappearing that's coming out of the coming out of the hills that water is now disappearing into the floodplain and into the shallow groundwater system so it is having some benefit on the shallow groundwater but not in terms of the flow we need to go all the way to the coast very very briefly the idea of actually harnessing water and keeping it for when you need it oh you know that that that, that's happening, there's more planned, that, that'll always, that, that can only really reliably and economically come from the big rivers, the big alpine rivers that are fed by the westerly, northwesterly systems. Tony, thank you very much indeed. Just a moment or two, we're going to be talking about how you should best market your property and make sure that you get the return that you deserve. sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try GrowSure Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with GrowSure from KiwiCare. Tom, marketing of rural properties, it's, it's changed. Definitely changed, Rob. Um, probably no more than in the probably last five or six years where the internet has really become the mainstream of how to profile a property uh, and get it online. We know it's in excess of 85% of all property inquiry, rather rural, commercial or residential, comes from online. And there's a couple of big mediums within New Zealand, realestate.co, TradeMe, etc. And that's the area of expertise and your property has to be online and has to be in lights and showcase the best possible way to attract the audience it needs. So the old core, core flute at the, at the gate doesn't really do it anymore? Oh, I think it's still important. Uh, I think one of the surprising factors is, is the local buyers in New Zealand. There's, there's a lot of property is transacted in New Zealand uh, from neighbours, those driving through town to see a property or the opportunity that might present itself. So the old sign at the front, still, uh, still very valuable, but the online presence is by far the most important attribute to have of your property today individual agents and their network? Vital, vital. It probably has always surprised me that, you know, look, you look at what's happened in rural New Zealand. The, your average farm, rural property has gone from a, a family venture, which it still is a family venture, but now it's a multi-million dollar business. And if you were gonna go and buy a commercial property, uh, invest in uh, some new development, you would be interviewing builders, getting second quotes, third quotes, getting consultants in, yet people just tend to ring up an agent and use them. You should be asking questions of how big their database is, how wide their global reach is, uh, to maximise the, the hard work, sweat and tears you've put into building this rural property up. That's interesting. You, you, you should interview your, your prospective agent. Absolutely. I think it's, it's, the industry is changing. Uh, if you come back to what, what is, why do you engage the services of a real estate agent to sell your farm? It's, it's to market the property to the widest possible audience and negotiate you the best possible price. You've, you've worked a lifetime to build this asset up and you might have some good friends, colleagues or people that know people that refer you someone. That's great. Referral business is fantastic. But you and your business partners, business owners have to be confident that the person you're engaging to sell your business now, I'm saying it's a business, is, is vital and you need to see some proof of the evidence of what their success has been 
and it's all very well saying you have a big database, but you want to see some proof in the pudding to make sure you're maximising that price. So how many properties are we talking about in a year? Well, the New Zealand uh, market in rural New Zealand uh, is worth about uh, $10 uh, billion. Uh, there's about 10,000 units get sold a year, uh, and that breaks down to roughly 80-20. 80, 80, the old 80-20 rule seems to come in. About 80% of all properties, rural properties sold in New Zealand are under 10 hectares. And there's some definition there, what's a lifestyle, what's not. You know, you've got to uh, take into account there's some two or three very productive uh, kiwi fruit hectare type properties in the Bay of Plenty. So call it 80-20. It's increasing slightly. We saw about a $500 million increase from 15 to 16 and about another five to 600 properties. But what would surprise most people in New Zealand, there's only about 800 properties a year over 50 hectares that are sold. It's, it's not a huge industry. It's actually very small. And so you, you need to be very, very, uh, I suppose, careful of maximising your, your hard work. And whilst that, you have to engage the services of a good agent. What areas have, have suddenly come into their own and have grown in the last 12 months? G good question. We've seen a revitalise of the dairy industry. Uh, they've had two, three seasons now of some pretty hard graph. And we've seen some top prices paid for properties, especially around the Waikato region. A lifestyle has come into its own in New Zealand. We've seen more and more farms throughout New Zealand split up, uh, becoming a lifestyle. So that's becoming a, 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 an opportunity for a farmer or farm holders to maximise or diversify their income throughout. And the increases in price level, as the New Zealand population increases through, let's take the central region, the new expressways, I remember growing up as a kid, it was a two and a half hour drive from uh, Auckland to the far side of Hamilton, uh, outside rush hour, uh, an hour and a half, hour and 20, and they're talking of more expressways going in. So the commute from the Waikato to Auckland is a possibility, and that's opened up that land through there. We've seen lifestyle properties increase upwards of 30% in the last 12 months alone through the Bay of Plenty, Waikato. And I think it's increased, increased population, but also the increase or the ease of commute uh, from those locations through. Of course, they traditionally turn over fairly quickly, though. They have been in the past, but we're seeing people really want to strive for that work-life balance and getting that balance right. Uh, we've seen a slight decrease in, in recent times as the prices in the Tauranga Bay, uh, Tauranga Bay of Plenty, Western Bay, through the Waikato have increased to a level that is not much between the prices now in Auckland for a lifestyle property and the Waikato Central. Uh, that's probably applicable through the Hawke's Bay. In fact, I was down there at an auction recently and the comment from an Auckland buyer was they were surprised how expensive the lifestyle properties were in the Hawke's Bay and compared it to Auckland. So we're really seeing quite a change throughout uh, the crop industry. Uh, as the global population increases, we're seeing more and more demand for people wanting to diversify their portfolio on the rural spectrum and um, secure land to grow the crops for the future, which is, which is a good thing for New Zealand. So let's go back to marketing. What what do you suggest or recommend? Well, that's a good question also. <laughs> and it's probably one that could be debated uh, over, over many of a beer. What's important is to profile the property, again, so I say to the widest audience. Now, people's attention span, as we know, <coughs> has decreased. You've got probably, I'd say, five to seven seconds uh, to highlight that property to the audience. So the photography is an absolute standout. Uh, for a property in New Zealand, over a million dollars, I'd say drone photography now is just a, a, a no-brainer. You need to get that it's drone. It's compulsory. It's just compulsory. Uh, full plans of the house, uh, as much as it might be a big working farm, people want to know where they're living. It, it's a big part of today, and there's a number of companies out there now that specialise in doing 3D rendering of properties, and even if your house doesn't have a set of plans, they can design and do plans for you, all very cost-effective. So. What you're trying to do is present your property in the best light to the widest audience and sort of not put up any objections. They want to look at the, from the entrance to the workshops, to the garage, to the bathrooms, how the house lays out, the, the stability of the land. It all has to be ready for them. Is there a rule of thumb or, or a formula to work out how much you should spend? Uh, always more than what the vendor wants to. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair comment. It's, it's, it's always, uh, always a bit of a tough one. Uh, I would say in today, 
If you've, you've got a property that's of substantial size, probably in excess of two and a half to $3 million upwards, you, you would have to be spending $5,000. Uh, that's it. So there's, there's no still sort of... a pretty of, small percentage. It time. is a very... And it's decreased because of the internet. You know, the days of taking half-page adverts in the paper are still very important, but it's nowhere as, as popular uh, as it used to be or required as it used to be. The online message is imperative, and that can be done in such a, a cost-effective way. So Tom, basically, it's getting out there and talking to the right people, right a people. Absolutely, more important than ever. Uh, interview your agent, see where they see where they're going, uh, make sure the message is right, and see what their support staff is like. Just because an agent knows the property, male or female, and and can talk to the son comes home, they need a good support crew behind them to actually do the admin and get the marketing, and that's social media. I don't know about you, Rob, but I'm a bit limited on that social media. <laughs> and uh, it'd be fair to say the younger generation through uh, do a lot better job, and that's vital in today's world. Tom, thank you very much. Pleasure, indeed. Rob. Thank you. Mo here had a recent conference, and we caught up with Jackie Freeman to find out how it went. Jackie Hemo here conference, how did it go? It went fantastic. We had a fantastic thing called Mo here producer from producer to profit. Uh, we had it ran over three days uh, in some nice hot weather. So we had 30 to 40 people attend each day, so it was really good. Uh, we had speakers, we had an international speaker, David Williams from Australia, who came um, and shared his knowledge of industry, global and of uh, to on classing to help um, educate the producers more and give them a greater insight and practical tips that they could take away and implement onto their own farm. So he was certainly well received by the producers. We also had Dr Mark Ferguson give a presentation on feed and nutrition and the positive impact that has on fibre production. So again some really good practical tips that they can take away to implement on their farms and think about their production. What was his main message? Because everybody thinks of a goat being sort of will eat anything, including your socks off the, off the clothesline. Oh, well, it was really just about good nutrition and good management. You know, if you are able to put in the good nutrition, you'll get the good fibre. So and really also looking at the genetics component as well, making sure that, you know, you have animals that are bred well and can withstand uh, certain elements environmentally. Uh, also look for, with a focus on good feet as well. So anything that's not up to scratch, it's, it's gone. So you had a lesson on culling. Yes, yes, that, that would be one way to put it. But no, he really gave the whole aspect of uh, what they did with in the merino industry as well. So we were, obviously because they're fibre producing, so many of those uh, factors related over to the mohair and angora industry. So. so we've got what to feed them and how to keep them upright. You've mm. got... Wall classing. Is there yes. any other take homes? Uh, there was the the focus really of the the current producer and the important role that they play in the mohair industry. That everything really starts with them. So with the guest speakers, they were able to enlighten them and just give them their industry knowledge that really some of them didn't have. Uh, and they can take that away with them, thinking about the the end product and the person. The consumer themselves and to think about every step in the process of mohair production that you know the importance that they play so making sure that you know everything that you can do from shearing to feeding uh, to all that good farm management uh, the role it plays in the end product. How important is wool classing for a mohair producer because to me it looks very similar all the way through. Oh, well it's very very important because obviously uh, micron is something that obviously uh, is very important because different microns go to, into different textiles. The finer stuff goes into the high-end garments and woven materials, whereas your short little locks, they end up in carpets, things like that. So all that sort of stuff. Uh, looking at um, the length, that's very important for any form of um, yarn or woven materials because obviously they have to create the tops. So it's, going, it's that process going on to the next, next stage. Uh, making and also it's good uh, for the producers to know exactly where the quality is uh, in their fibre so it's my job to make sure that I'm also educating them on what they're doing well and ways that they can improve. Because you, you as an exporter can't be expected to class everything that comes across. I class everything that comes through this 
warehouse. So, and we have a very good reputation uh, overseas with our buyers and with our local buyers. Uh, so it's really important that I'm maintaining that quality. Uh, everything, um, every part of Mohia is uh, useful, so that's really good. Uh, and just, just giving pointers to the producers so that they know, you know, if you produce the quality, you're going to get those good returns. So some of them were quietly blown away? They were, by, especially by the actual processing of uh, the mohair from a, um, from a manufacturer's point of view, just knowing the ins and outs and just, just it's just not about taking the mohair off the, go off the angora goat and getting it to the warehouse, it's, you know, and all the responsibility that's put back now on the producer uh, to really look at, you know, every stage making, you know, with the shearing. Jackie, there must be quite a few different stages. Yes, there certainly is. Uh, making sure that uh, you know that you get your shearing, you know, six monthly. That it's packaged up right. All your stain and all those um, variables are packaged separately. Uh, obviously, it comes here to be classed. Uh, then it's bailed. Uh, then sent to South Africa. Uh, where again it will be resorted because the, the different buyers over there have different requirements uh, made into tops, so, sold on again to those other buyers who then turn it into uh, the woven materials or the yarn, the dyeing, the carding, the scouring. The scouring part certainly blew them away. They were like, wow, we didn't really know a lot about that. So they certainly learnt a lot. And that's yeah. before it becomes a garment. Yes, that's yes. It's, a, it's quite a, quite an, uh, a a long process, but it certainly is in detailed. But uh, they certainly have a good education about that now. <laughs> It's going to help the industry because the industry is still quite small. It is. It is a niche industry. Uh, but after the conference, we have found ev even before the conference, we're always getting you know new producers coming along, which is exciting. Uh, but uh, it's certainly um, ex an exciting future for the industry. We're all on all on the same uh, boat, and uh, we're going to sail into a positive future. So looking at ways we can do that and the good, the good thing is everyone knows one another, they're an industry where people can help one another, the Mohair producers Canterbury who help host the uh, conference, we all just work together well as a team, we've got enthusiasm and passion and if you've got those two things driving an industry and wanting to always improve and learn I think you've got a really good industry. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try GrowSure Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with GrowSure from KiwiCare. David, the Foundation for Arable Research, how does it work? How, how, what's your role? Our role is the, uh, the research and development arm for arable farming, so we're a levy based organisation and our role is to use those levies to, um, to work on the research which growers want done in the area of arable farming. So you listen to people and find solutions? So yeah, the people we listen to are our levy payers, which are the farmers, so we have uh, a number of arable research groups around the country and those farmers feed the information back to us as to where the research needs to be d done and developed and from there we get, the, get that research done and then do the extension back to them. R&D in an industry which has, with all due respect, got its back against the wall at times, must be majorly important. Yeah, it is. It's very important. Uh, one thing we can't influence is the prices, but we can influence obviously the, uh, the yields we can get as well as the input costs in the system. So um, knowing those input costs and Getting high yields are the ways we can get around uh, these lower prices we're seeing at the moment. But um, there's also new things around, the, uh, such as environmental issues, 
um, and sustainability, which we need to be working Ooh, on as well. Do you get in amongst that lot? Because that's a can of worms. It's, it's a hot topic at the moment, I guess, but the arable system is actually very uh, lucky in that its systems are very sustainable and because we're able to match plant demands and, and um, the crop uptake as well. So we're probably one of the sectors that are in the a box seat there as far as um, environmental concerns. As far as environmental concerns as well as product concerns, your, your guys must have a lot of questions and, and want you to do a lot of things. We do. There's, uh, there's about 40 crops which the levy um, covers and so there's a lot of research across those 40 crops. So one of the big challenges is working out which is the prioritisation of those researchers and uh, where that money should be spent. So that is a, one of the big challenges. How do you respond to the recent reviews? Uh, the reviews have been great, so we went out to our growers and said, well, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, and there was a number of things, generally everything was going right, but there are some areas which we can uh, improve on, as any business can improve on in certain areas. So, so this is you going to your members, or going to your levy payers and saying, what are we doing right, and what are we doing wrong? And probably most importantly, what are we doing wrong? You know, it's already, we know that most of the things we're doing right, we, we understand them because we can see the results from the research. But it's areas where we, we need to be putting more emphasis, which is really important. How do you prioritise what you're going to be doing, what crops you're going to be doing the research on? Uh, a little bit, it depends on where the money comes from. So obviously we try to match um, levy take for different crops to those research for those crops, but also where the demand is. So at the moment there's a lot of demand on environmental, so we've um, added extra staff into that area to cover the demand off, because out of the review, the environmental compliance was the number one area of concern for growers. I guess one of your sort of obvious sites is, is at Chertsey. How important are those field days to you? They're very important. Chertsey is a pretty local uh, central, central Canterbury area. Um, we've also got a new site at Lincoln just beside the university which is going to be um, used by students as well as the industry. So that's a, a second site um, in Canterbury that we've got and also we've got our site at Waikato just out of Hamilton. You don't sort of think of the Waikato being a, an arable research area, but of course you've got maize and you've got all sorts of things up there. So one of our biggest crops is maize, and obviously the North Island maize is the main crop up in that area, and that is one of the, um, the key crops for New Zealand's agriculture, particularly in the North Island. So uh, making sure that we are servicing the North Island and the maize industry is, is vitally important. David, if you get a, a new fashion for the want of a better term, like for example, you've suddenly got fodder beet. Do you, you have to roll with the times? We do have to work with the times, but we also got to make sure that we are getting an income levy from those crops. So at the moment, we don't get an income levy from forage crops, but we have done some work in that area because that's what the demand from growers have said. We want to know information in that area. So once again, you've got two ears for listening and one for talking. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way of putting it, right? Yeah, because I mean, the, I mean it's, you listen twice as much as you actually talk about yeah. it. So. So, but new crops, we're just working with Central Plains Water at the moment on a, a project, project called uh, Future Foods, and that's looking at what could be the new uh, foods we're producing or crops we're growing in Canterbury in the next, uh, or in New Zealand in the next um, five to ten years. You've got a referendum coming up? Yep, so because we're a commodity levy order, we, uh, every five to six years we need to go back to our levy payers and, um, and they vote on whether they want to continue with the levy. So that's coming up in August this year. And um, yeah, we want to make sure we don't have complacency amongst the uh, growers. We want them to get out and, and vote and um, have a good return for the vote. Well, they've got wrong editorialising, they'll be very foolish not to not to keep going. We'd hope so, yeah. And you've also got a um, seminar coming up. Yeah, so every, every two years we have a main conference, uh, and this year's conference is on the 29th and 30th of June, and it's being held at Lincoln University. So um, registrations for those are open at the moment uh, at the FAR office and also on our website. Important times for you guys. I think it's always important times, Rob. We, um, we need to be trying to front foot the issues which we're facing, and um, it's a tough one. You never know what's coming around the corner, but um, I think that's one of our roles is to make sure we're ahead of the game. And um, I think so far we have been. In As an observer, David, you've got nothing to worry about. You're well, well ahead of it. So thank you very much indeed. And on the On The Land program and our website and, of course, all our social media, you'll be able to get some updates on what FAR are, in fact, up to over the next few weeks. But as we said, I don't think it's a hard decision. I think get out and vote and slam your future into the right area. Duck shooting, well... 
Let's have a look at Chloe Tipple, who is not only number nine in the world as far as skeet shooting is concerned, but also has been involved with duck shooting for a long, long time. Now, duck shooting, when did you start duck shooting? Well, the first photo was when I was about four years old, all camoed up in the Mai Mai, but I think we were out there as soon as we could, as soon as we could get dressed up in a jacket, Dad would take us out to the Mai Mai, and we loved it. We loved the hype, we loved getting out there and getting involved, and I wanted to shoot a gun as soon as I could, so we were, uh, we were, we were shooting almost before we could walk. <laughs> We've come a long way because the old days of just putting a hat on and wandering off to your mind yeah. mind, now there's all this amazing gear. Definitely. I mean, now you've got to, I mean, it's recommended you have camo paint, you, your camo gears, your motion decoys. All of it is going to help you get one more extra bird, one more extra, extra target. So it's definitely worth it. It's definitely worth all the goods. Innovation. You've mm. got decoys that, that do all sorts of things now. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we have the flashing splasher, the swimming mallard. The, the ducks are attracted to movement in the pond, so as, if you can get movement, if you can get a motion decoy which disturbs the water, and that's what attracts the ducks and gets them out. So not just having a stationary decoy, actually having movement in the pond is what you'll see increase the birds coming in. Is there much demand? Because it used to be a, a religion almost, but now it doesn't seem to be so strong. Oh no, it's definitely still a religion. You'll have your regular customers which will come and come in and spend up you don't know where the money comes from, but this duck shooting season, I think, is such an amazing sport um, for so many people to come together. You've got families that come together for a day. You've got old mates that it's what they've done for 20 years. It's the one day they all get together. It's a, it's a really, it's an amazing day that you, I, I don't think we realise how many people participate in duck shooting season. It really brings people together. It's, well, perhaps that's my, my perception because, <laughs> you know, I haven't been out for, for years, but it, it was a very, very big event. Yes, it's a huge event. It's a huge event. I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but it's phenomenal how many, license, how many licenses we sell and how many people participate on opening morning. It's one of the biggest, I think it's actually the most participated sport in all of New Zealand. More people go duck shooting on opening morning than play rugby in New Zealand. The lead versus steel, as a lot of people walked away when, when we had to use steel. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. I mean, of course, when you've, when, a lot of people don't like change, but nowadays steel is, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of options out there which you, will, you, will, you can definitely still shoot and kill birds effectively with steel. It's finding the right combination between brand, ammunition, what your gun is, where you, what your choke should be. It's definitely still effective. Obviously lead is going to be more effective, it's heavier, it's more malleable, you will have more killing power, but you can find equivalent, if not, not, not so much equivalent, but a, a, very good, um, a very good second best in steel. So perhaps somebody should come in here with their shotgun and talk to the gunsmith? Yes, definitely. Or one of the salesmen here, we'll, we, can, we can definitely help you out with what choke you should use, what ammunition we recommend in steel. Um, there's many different brands and many different velocities and we'll, we'll, we'll find a right combination for you. Because that's one of the things that I found was mm. I thought, what choke do I use? And I didn't want it to go bump and, and not work or whatever. Well, there's so know. many different aspects of duck shooting and, and what you, you know, what ammo, what, what choke. There's five different chokes, there's six different sizes of, of duck ammunition. It's, 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 it can be quite confusing. As far as the guns, have they changed very much? You're obviously a, a Beretta <laughs> fan, but... Yes, Beretta, Benelli. I mean, I think what we find is that the same brands are, are, are kind of um, sprucing up their models. So the models over the last 20 years have been, have been much the same. Now the Beretta A400 with the recoil reducing stock, that's come out in probably the last five years. It's a really, really great gun. Um, your Benelli's, they've had a very, very similar gun over the last 20 years. Um, so the guns are still are still the same. You'd, we're dealing with two different types of operation, gas and inertia. And so we've got many different brands that fit within that. And tell me a bit more about this camouflage thing. Do <laughs> you, you, you turn up with those on the morning or do you set them up beforehand? Well, it depends. A lot of guys will build a, a standalone Mai Mai. You know, they've, they've spent their, the last month preparing with, with camo nets and everything. But we do have the blinds, which are so easy. You just set them up like a tent and they unfold instantly. And that's really handy if you've got quite a few people shooting in the same place and um, you want to spread out. Or because they're mobile, obviously, you can change your position during the day if you're finding where you are isn't working. So it's really handy. And especially for those people that don't have time to build their Mai Mai. You've got single chair and double chair and you've got quad blinds, so it's amazing the, um, the camo blinds that we have as well.
And of course those decoys that I'm still chuckling about. <laughs> Yes, the motion decoys, honestly, it's really worth it. I think once you give it a go and you see how well they work in the environment, you're blown away. You, what, you wouldn't shoot without one once you've used one. And the circling ducks? Yes, the circling ducks, they're my favourite. One year we set them out at the back of the Mai Mai because we didn't have room in the front of the Mai Mai. We were wondering why all the ducks were wanting to land at the back of the Mai Mai. They attract the ducks so well, they are so attracted to movement. So it's really well worth having a movement decoy. And one last shot. For we who enjoy mm. duck shooting, it's not actually murder, it's actually culling. It is. I think if, I mean, it's really amazing if you get into the conservation of duck shooting. You know, the ducks, they do, they can destroy the waterways, they can eat a lot of the feed that the farmers want to conserve. There's a whole lot of things um, that are benefits of, of duck shooting for our environment. And we, we, we do, we have an, an outrageous amount of numbers of ducks and we need to cull them. We're helping the environment. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Jason, Stock X, what's the background? Stock X, Rob, well it's um, been going for a few years in terms of its conception before it's been released to market. So the background's a couple of guys got together in Hawke's Bay, John Cannon and Andrew Russell, a farm consultant and a, a farmer respectively, and had a view that you know, the, the world of livestock tra trading needed to change and that there was uh, too much cost and inefficiency involved in that. They put together a bit of a, a, a product called StockX and they took that to market and raised some capital and we've got 45 shareholders, about 30 of those are actively farming themselves um, and look to build a model that can change the way livestock's traded nationally. Because the world has moved on as far as the traditional farming that's been going back the last couple of hundred years. Yeah, significantly, significantly. So livestock trading online is nothing new, um, but it is to New Zealand. And uh, a few entities have had a go at doing this in the past. And in large part, they haven't addressed the critical factor. And the critical factor in livestock trading is how do you address the transaction to make sure that it's safe and secure for buyers and sellers to trade. And at StockX, we think we've delivered on that. Well, I was just going to ask you, how did you do that? What are, what are you doing? So what we've done is we've standardised the livestock descriptions for different livestock categories and classes. And you know, a listing, when it's created by a seller, that seller is guaranteeing that they will deliver that quality as, of animals as described to the buyer. The buyer is required to place funds into a trust account before the stock leave the seller's property. That gives both parties security around the transaction knowing that what has been represented to be sold will be delivered and correspondingly the money won't go to the seller of the livestock until the buyer receives the stock as described. And is happy with them. And is happy with them, absolutely. And so there's a feedback rating where the buyer and seller can rate the, the, each other on the transaction and it's completely transparent. So buyer and seller can see information about who they are where they are located and what type of farming activity they are involved in. Who organises the transport? The buyer typically, but um, we can help facilitate that uh, if the parties choose to, 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 to use us. And obviously somebody has to pay the, the ferryman? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so generally that's buyer's, buyer's cost, as is typically the case, unless there's some specifics around the transaction that are seeing the seller pay the freight. So how do you get three meals a day? We get our three meals a day. And, uh, uh, only by charging a small commission uh, at the conclusion of a successful trade, so we're entirely success based. 
and we're two and a half percent as opposed to the industry standard of five to six percent for store stock transactions. And what StockX does, Rob, is, is quite interesting. It's a disintermediator. So we're taking out the middleman. We're taking out those positions where agents buy stock on, on behalf of themselves and sell on at a, at a profit. We're removing the transport costs and the yarding fees and obviously the commission difference from a seller's perspective of getting to market. So that can make a considerable difference to both buyers and sellers around the value that they get from a transaction. Yeah, there'd be a lot of buyers who would suggest that they want to actually eyeball the stock. Yeah, absolutely, and that is entirely achievable through StockX. So again, remembering that it's a completely transparent market, you can see who you're buying from, you can find out the details around the seller, where they're located, and you know phone numbers and names. You can arrange to go and see the stock, and we have a lot of buyers that do do that. So while you can buy over the internet, you can have a standardised description of the livestock, you can see video and photos of animals, you can see weight files, growth rates, all those attributes that you may want to inquire about a line of stock and to ascertain its quality. You can also arrange to go and see them in the flesh. We absolutely encourage that and that happens frequently. As, as far as uptake is concerned? We've got about uh, 1,800 farmers that have registered with us in the 18 months that we've been operating and you know that's growing significantly month on month so we're seeing that sort of that escalation in, in registrations and certainly in trading activity as well. Is this based on what's happening overseas? Uh, do you mean in terms of market uptake and, and the transition for farmers? I think so, I think you know farmers uh, as a category of people in the New Zealand economy are adopting technology rapidly much more quickly than probably a lot of people realise and that's that's driven by access to you know internet uh, connectivity, but also it's about driving cost out of their businesses and increasing the efficiencies that they can achieve through livestock trading. And having a platform orientation around StockX allows buyers and sellers to have access to a national market, and that's really important because what that does is that smooths out um, you know, prices or opportunities to purchase different categories of livestock that people might be interested in, uh, in acquiring that they don't normally have access to through. Uh, their agency contacts, which is limited to the contacts that that person knows. Jason, how is the price for stock established? Is it an auction system or is it a set price? So the, the pricing mechanism for StockX and, and the transaction process is one of open tender, Rob. So that allows a seller to list livestock, put a price indication. Now that price indication isn't a reserve uh, and that allows buyers to bid and they may bid higher or lower than the price indication depending on how the market is performing within the week. The seller then has the choice of who they might want to sell to, or not at all. Oh, okay, so just because you've got 700 heifers doesn't mean to say that the price is going to be what you want. No, that's right, so you don't have to be committed to selling. And that is what an auction does, doesn't it? It gives you a commitment to a process without a known outcome. So the open tender situation gives a lot of choice and a lot of control back to the selling farmer. You don't have to pay for transport to get them to a yard and back if you don't sell them, I guess. A absolutely, and that is often the unenviable situation that sellers are placed in. You know, When they put all that effort into raising their stock and sending them to market, so there's that transport cost to get them there, again, the yardage fees, and again, the, you know the commission rates that are, are payable in that normal traditional market five six percent all of those costs are sunk ahead of an unknown outcome as to price so StockX you get an opportunity to meet the market find out what value you can achieve and then choose what the price is that you want to accept if a buyer puts an unrealistic figure on it because I'm thinking the real estate everybody wants to double their price <laughs> That it won't sell. So there's no, no that's issue. right. And interestingly, the, the buyers in StockX uh, are generally quite responsible in how they respond to price because StockX is just another market within a multitude of livestock market opportunities out there. So prices generally are relatively robust across markets. So the seller and the buyer has very, very little risk associated with a transaction through StockX. People can see the stock on their computer screen? Yeah absolutely, so there's a complement of uh, videos and complement of photos and again you can upload weight files and they may, may be from uh, for example your true test scales which can show growth rates for, for animals relating to the individually ID tag numbers so 
there's a preponderance of information that a buyer can uh, you know, interrogate or look to to give them confidence that what they're buying is what they require. And it's across the board, it's sheep, beef and dairy? Sheep, beef, dairy and deer, Rob. So all, all store stock uh, transactions are catered to within StockX. Is it seasonal? I guess it probably is. Oh, all livestock transactions are seasonal um, and the way we address, uh, or an interesting way in which we address that is allowing buyers to put up stock wanted notices. So this is a two-sided market, so it allows sellers to sell and buyers to inquire of the market for livestock they are wanting to buy. Also there's a whole lot of functionality on the exchange whereby you can set up personalised alerts which can of course be seasonal. So if you're looking for store lambs, during the store lamb season, you perhaps might be looking for lines of lambs in excess of 500. Uh, every time a listing of that type gets listed on StockX, StockX the system will send you an alert and it goes direct to your smartphone, you know, click a link and then you can bid on them. So we've had people that have been driving the tractor during cropping and they've bought the complement of their trading lambs for the season. We've had people that have had their feet up by the fire the night before a sale when the, you know, the weather's been quite stormy and thought I'd rather probably not go to the sale yards and they've been able to purchase, purchase stock from the comfort of their living room lounge. Jason, we've come a hell of a long way, haven't we? We have and I think you know, there's a lot, lot further that, that we can go and um, you know, we're just really starting on a journey, Rob, that's going to see a, a lot of change and a lot of functionality and um, transactional capabilities delivered to farmers you know, through technology and that's going to unlock a lot of value. Times are certainly a changing. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but it will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.